You're good to go, Sarah. Great. Thanks, Carmen. Well, welcome, um, everyone, to our second to last um, lecture of the spring 2020 lecture series. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Angeliki Scioli um, today, who's the assistant professor um, at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. Um, Angeliki is an assistant professor at the Department of Architecture at TU Delft. She obtained her professional diploma in architecture from the University of Thessaly and was granted a post-professional master's in architectural theory and history by the National Technical University of Athens. She completed her doctor of philosophy in the history and theory of architecture at McGill University. She's a registered architect and has worked on projects ranging from residential and office buildings to the design of small scale objects and books. Her research seeks connections between architecture and literature in the public realm of the city, focusing on aspects of embodied perception of place in the urban environment. Um, and her lecture today is um, based on kind of engaging Frederick Kiesler's writings on his lifelong project, The Endless House. This lecture discusses how to imagine the domestic environment based on the poetic aspects of our everyday habits. In a period when we spend more and more time in our homes, how can Kiesler's thoughts and intentions reveal marvelous prospects for living? So welcome, Angelique. Thank you, Sarah, very much for this very beautiful introduction. It sounds way more serious than it really is, to be honest. Uh, and thank you for the students, the few students that are here, despite the very busy period of the semester. I know how it is. My own students are very busy as well, so I appreciate it a lot. Um, the invitation uh, to participate in this wonderful lecture series in 2022 actually found me uh, quite unprepared because uh, when I asked with Sarah, I went up with Sarah, uh, what, is, uh, what possible topics could be there? Uh, her answer was like, there's not specifically one topic, but we're actually looking for uh, inspiring and invigorate, invigorating work. So I was like, okay, now what do I, what am I presenting? <laughs> uh, so as you can see, I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, the, topic, uh, the topic of today's conversation and discussion we can have together is the endless marvel of everyday living. Um, one second, so I can go full screen for you. Um, because I thought that what can be invigorating and inspiring after the most uninspired two years we had globally, altogether, after the most uninspiring period in the history of uh, our 21st century of being stuck at home. And what can I talk, what should I talk about? Uh, it's true that the last two years we have actually spent, uh, yes, this is the topic and the lecture, we have actually spent more than, uh, uh, almost more, uh, I'm sorry, up to 35 more time in our homes. Uh, and this is true about people all over the world. This is a diagram here that shows the different uh, geographical areas and how much more time we have been spending than usual. With so much time in our homes, uh, you actually see me with, by the background of my home, the China cabinet right now giving a lecture. With so much time in our homes, how does the architecture make us feel? How does it influence us, the architecture of our home? How does it allow us to get inspired? And how does it invigorate us, since that's what we're looking for in this lecture series? And does it, if it does? So with this question in mind, when I received a very kind invitation by Sara, my thoughts drifted slowly to an architect that I particularly admire, Friedrich Kistler. I thought of Kistler for many, many reasons, but particularly because of his tireless, lifelong interest in redefining what a house should be, in redefining how living and everyday life in a, in a house should actually take place, and how, as Kistler used to say, how it should reveal their, its magic. Even without the pandemic, many, many years before our current pandemic, actually, Kistler was very critical about the housing condition of his time, which are fortunately are very similar with the housing conditions of our time. What price do we pay, he used to say, for our lack of resistance to conformity, whether in labor-saving devices or human relations? To answer this question, Kistler used to always advocate, becomes more and more paramount for each one of us. Art and architecture can and must contribute to the clarification of this issue for us, slaves of indirect living. And you can see him here preparing a manifesto, lying down on the floor with his cat, preparing a manifesto for new standards in life activities, as he says, against indirect living. So I thought that in a time of the absolute indirect living, like ours, that almost everything takes place through the screen, 
Looking at Kistler's attempt to make the place of the house magical is actually absolutely pertinent. But let's take the story from the beginning. Kistler was born in Chernobyl, which now belongs in Ukraine, and I hope that it continues belonging in Ukraine. And when he was 18, he moved to Vienna, where basically he studied both at the Technical University and the Academy of Fine Arts. In Vienna, Kistler started working Apologies for that. Here, in Vienna, Kisser started working on theater set design. And in 1924, he proposed the very famous uh, space stage, a cyclical installation that was rotating on the stage. And for the time period, it was a very innovative thing. In 1926, he moved with his wife in New York, big transatlantic move, where they arrived, you can see him here in the customs waiting to enter the city, where he arrived with more than 40 crates of exhibits for the International Theatre Exposition. Kistler and his wife stayed in, stayed in New York and settled there until the end of their lives. From that point on, Kistler worked on a big, wide, big variety of projects, from stage designs to art exhibitions, shops and commercials, furniture and architecture, the last image actually of this slide shows his famous building, the Shrine of the Books, that was completely towards the very end of his life. President Obama actually visited in March of 2013 in order to see the Dead Sea Scrolls for which this building was actually done. Alongside his very creative career and throughout his whole life though, Kistler kept constantly working on a project that he called the Endless House. And you can see him here working on a model of this very endless house. This housing project, which was very dear to Kistler, was in some way his manifesto against all things that he considered wrong in the architecture of his time. First and foremost, Kistler reacted against functionalism, an architectural tendency pretty prevalent back then, but pretty permanent today as well. For him, functionalism was merely a way to standardize routine daily activities. It enabled the food to walk, but not to dance. It enabled the eye to see, but not to envision, and had to grasp, but not actually to create. He believed that architecture should enable what exists beyond the merely practical, and that it should be based on the fullness of life. Some of these beliefs were influenced by his involvement with this realist group of artists while he was in New York and while they were in New York. You can see him here actually with a surrealist, in this very slide, this is Kistler, and this is an opportunity, this is a celebration for a fairway uh, party for André Breton, one of the main founders of the, of, the, of the movement. As you very well know, the surrealist artistic production, uh, both the writers and the artists of the movement, were heavily driven by the ambition to reveal meaning in everyday life. Breton's essay, The Crisis of the Object, uh, that was published around 1936, was especially calling for a creative relationship between what is real and what exists beyond the real, and for the necessity to reveal the marvelous, to reveal the wonderful, to reveal the inspiring, the invigorating in everyday life. Perhaps Magritte's painting, to mention just an example, is a very good representation of the surrealist intentions, where here, as you can see, the walls of a room turn into the sky, and the everyday objects acquire a life of their own, and things start becoming magical, unexpected. Along the same lines, Kistler's endless house shared some of the surrealist intentions and evolved into new directions. Kistler always believed that architecture should shelter those endless mutations of life force, which seem to be part of the practical as well as of the magical, and could offer its inhabitants an exuberant life. Although Kistler worked on the Endless House for almost 30 years of his career, we are not left with much. We have some models, some few sketches, and two sets of drawings, you can see them on this slide, which actually Kistler drafted for a potential client that was interested in building the house, although it was never actually built. This material on its own, which is the material that we as architects and architectural students are used to work with, models, sketches, drawings, this material on its own, unfortunately, does not truly reveal what Kistler envisioned for the life of the inhabitants in this very unique domestic environment. What actually 
makes us be able to understand this project better is all the things that Kistler wrote and talked about. Kistler's own words. He talked and wrote about the Endless House in interviews, in articles, and most importantly, in this book that you see on this, uh, on this slide, called Inside the Endless House, and that was published six months after his death. In the pages of this book, Kistler collects ideas, opinion, thoughts, concerns about architecture, impressions from for a number of trips around the world, and thoughts and intentions for the house, the endless house, over the course of these many years. From this book, which is almost more than 500 uh, pages, I will read to you some few excerpts today in order to communicate with you how everyday, everyday life in this house would have been. During the course of these years, the endless changed a little bit in form and small details here and there would change. But one thing that was constantly the same is that Kistler thought that nothing in this house should or could be taken for granted, either of the house itself, the floors, the walls, the ceiling, the coming of people or of the light, the air with its warmth or coolness. So let me please take you through these elements as mentioned by Kistler, one by one, the floor, the walls, the ceilings, and talk to you about how living would have been, what would have been the endless marvels of living inside the endless house. So let's start with the entrance. As you can see in this model, the house is raised on three gigantic columns, so that as Kistler explained in an interview in CBS, actually cars can drive underneath. He had a fascination for cars. You can actually see him here in an automobile exhibition. And if we study close the drawings, we can see that each column, you can see here on the plan, each column indeed accommodates and gives access to a staircase that allows us to enter the main part of the house. The middle staircase rises into the house central area indicated with the word living. The north staircase leads directly to the parents area and it's actually the only one that you can see as you drive towards the house. You can see here on this part of the facade. And the circular staircase inside the south column ascends directly into the kitchen. Both the north and the south show and the south staircases seem to uh, be reserved for, for private use. And as the ground floor shows, the main entrance is basically done through the middle larger staircase. The architectural drawings convey nothing more uh, based on nothing more about Kistler's larger idea about the ritual of entering the house. On May 14th, though, in 1961, when he visited Palm Beach in Florida to examine a potential lot for the building, Kistler explained to the lot owners and prospective uh, uh, client what he had envisioned about the, the access, the, uh, I'm sorry, the action of entering. No one can enter the endless house with shoes on, Kistler would say. That goes for the family as well as for the guests. To be specific, there will be dressing quarters close to the entrance of the house for men, women, and children with an exuberant wardrobe of capes, saris, panchos in many colors, textures, weights, and sizes to be worn loosely or tight over the body. It was interesting for me, Kistler, Kistler continued, to hear of a silk and shoe manufacturer from Hong Kong who offered to deliver slippers without soles, just covering the arch, made with many colored feathers or silk, velvets or furs, because I made it clear to him that everyone's home is a sacred place and a silent walk is imperative. As you already saw, the drawing, the, the drawing show no such dressing quarters filled with any of those special outfits that Kistler imagined and talked about. The middle entrance room is definitely spacious enough to accommodate them. What we can imagine from the architect's description is that the ritual of entering, be barefoot and dressed in appropriate clothes, would prepare both inhabitants and visitors to leave behind the mundane world and to merge into a space that should be understood, that should be felt, should be appreciated as sacred. 
Let's look into the floors now, because you can already tell by the drawings and the, and the model that something is going on. Moving inside the endless house challenges the very activity of walking, as one's walk do not take place on a level, on a level floor, but instead on curvilinear floors with different slopes and levels. More specifically, in the West in these elevations, we can actually discern at least four slightly different four levels, but of course there are no steps or ramps that connect the main floor. The same is confirmed if we examine the two longitudinal sections that we have on the other set of drawings. An entry in the journal in May 23rd of 1961 reveals a pretty interesting intention that Kistler had for the floors. In the endless house, he explains, there is the concept of the floors, which are treated in such a curvilinear way that they seem to be moving under your feet. They are not flat, and when you walk barefoot on them, the lifting and setting down of your body, plus moving at the same time, is like discovering your potentiality of flying. This is just one example of reconditioning our reflexes, Kistler insists. Our life is conditioned by whatever we create around us. Just this one idea of a new floor would bring us much closer to truth within nature because we would not just be using our feet to walk on shoes and throw them on floors, but to walk on the very soil of the house. Keeping in mind this intention and looking back at the drawings, it's difficult, it's really not difficult to imagine that walking inside the house requires a conscious adjustment of one's steps, especially in the steeper parts of the Carolinian floors. After waking up in the bedroom, for example, in the morning, in order to go to the kitchen for a morning coffee, one would transverse four different slopes. I'm not really sure if that's what I need before my morning coffee booster, but this is what the architect really envisioned. So, one more piece of information about the floors, not to be seen on the drawings, nowhere, but just the drawings that had actually to do with their materiality. The floors of the endless house, Kistler writes, naturally have many textures, such as pebbles, sand, rivulets, grass, planks, heated terracotta tiles, so that everyone can be touching the floor and be stimulated by the touch. Imagine a floor with rivulets. That's all I'm asking you. We should learn to live on the floor and we should learn to live not on the floor, I'm sorry, but with the floor. Unfortunately, he never specified where he was imagining the different materials and how he would have distributed them throughout the house. Let's move on to the walls and the ceilings now, because this walking experience on this Carvelinian floor is kind of extended into a similar treatment on the walls and the ceilings, which you can pretty much already figure out from how uh, the house looks, from its shape. In the very first version of the project, there were some typical interior walls, but very soon Kistler got rid of them, and the undulating floors became sculpturally continuous with the external walls, while the interior walls had uh, completely disappeared in order to give to create this spatial continuity that was very important for him. The sections confirm that very clearly, and the walls, floor, and ceilings never meet on any sharp angles, but they just fuse together very naturally, uninterrupted by columns or beams. Kistler was adamant against separation of space. He used to say that cubicles for the standard functions in our, in our, of our everyday life, like bathrooms or kitchen, are basically deadening experience. And he said, and he believed, that if all spaces were kept open and free flowing, then the inhabitant could be the architect of their own life, and that could actually be inspiring. Life has a chance to become inventive, he, he says. You as the inhabitant, you become the architect of your house. We don't want cellophane between two pairs of lips. We want the naked touch. And that's what he felt should be the condition between the different spaces, a naked touch, a naked real actual kiss. In continuation of floors and ceilings, Kistler also conceived the surface of the roof 
as a private landscape of low hills and soft meadows. I think that may be particularly interesting for the landscape architect, uh, architectural students. And in this roof, as he thought, inhabitants could enjoy a break and rest under the sun, protected by the shadows of the roof's of the roof's own volumes. In the book, he states that I always felt, and here you can see basically a sketch of what he was uh, dreaming. I always felt that there should be a way of getting onto the roof of the house because it has such lovely valleys where one can sit or lie in full form in delicious comfort, sheltered on its planes and inclinations. And he literally writes delicious comfort, which I find a very fascinating way of describing this possibility of taking a break. So it would come as no surprise, after having talked a little bit about walls, floor, ceilings, and the roof that all flow into each other, that, of course, he never thought of any conventional furniture for this domestic environment. I include here a sketch on purpose depicting Kistler sitting on a very conventional chair. But what Kistler imagined for the house was basically furniture that would, that they, that would come and grow out of the walls and the, and the floors. And the inhabitants would rest on concave surfaces where floors turn into the walls at this very interesting moment. This is one of his sketches, imagining the inhabitants resting on this concave possibility. He also thought that a second shell added along certain parts of the exterior wall would basically provide storage space, especially in the dining area, the kitchen, and the bedrooms. And he very clearly explained that he wanted no beds. That was inspired by a trip he had done in Sao Paulo, where he was really fascinated by the view of woven, woven hammocks in beautiful colors between tea trunks, uh, tea trunks, and he insisted that hammocks should be in the endless house instead of beds. From these very tangible elements, Kistler started thinking in similar ways about the intangible elements of the house, particularly the light. This is a light study you see here, and you can see that he has been imagining lights inside the endless house, but also lights towards the outside. The treatment of the light, I won't argue, is probably one of the most characteristic in showing his attempts to make everyday life magical. Beside the artificial light that Kistler was actually considering, along with the natural light, he believed first and foremost that fenestration should not be determined by how openings look from outside. He didn't care about a beautifully, aesthetically beautiful facade. His interest was how light looks from inside. In his very last article called The Future, Notes on Architectural Sculpture, he specified that in the endless, each area has vast openings in different shapes and forms according to the orbit of the sun and the prevailing winds. You can see them in the drawings. And they are filled not with glass necessarily, another important design decision that is nowhere to be understood from the drawings, but with molded reliefs in colored plastics of various thicknesses, so that the heat of the sun is basically refracted and is also filling the interior space with different colors. In each of these larger or smaller openings, which during the evening, by the way, they receive the same light artificially from the outside, there are certain sections which are clear and translucent, affording a free view and visual connection to the side environment. The drawings show that some of these openings are small and directed towards, let's say, the sky. For example, this one that is on the ceiling of the parents' area, and that would basically enable them to watch the star before falling asleep towards the moon or the sky. Other openings, such as the central openings in the facade here in the west elevation, are two stories high, really, really big openings. There are no technical specifications for them, by the way. And there are other that include the staircases to the mezzanine, for example, and the mezzanine itself, and so on in the west elevation. It's not difficult to imagine that there would be a real theatrical quality in the shadows of the inhabitants' everyday activities celebrating the real life that Kistler valorized, offering these shadows into the public almost as an installation, as a performance. 
There is no one more element that has to do with light that really merits special attention. And please stick with me here. I know it's late in the afternoon, but this is particularly beautiful. The first version of this uh, device, uh, which is called the color clock, is shown in this, uh, in this drawing, in this quick sketch. In this one, the shape of the endless house looks really still like an egg, is one of the very, very first versions. But this is not that important. What is this important is that this apparatus, probably still existing at the very last version of the house, it's fair to assume that this element on this south elevation is probably the same, is this color, uh, color clock. And is a device that Kisler explained very in, very, in a lot of detail in uh, his article, uh, Endless House and, this, and its Psychological Lighting. The psychological Lighting is quite an interesting term. The color clock, and this is a drawing done by Kisler, please imagine that this section is the section of the roof, this is the interior space of the house, and this is the color clock on the roof. And these colors here, I'm going to explain right away. The color clock combined prismatic glass and mirrors, these are the arrows that Kistler imagined how they, they would direct the light, that would receive light from the sun, divide it into spectral colors, and then reflect it throughout the house. If we look at the drawing carefully, we can imagine that the sunlight at the dawn of the day, at the very beginning of the day, would be diffused by a deep yellow mirror fill, filling the interior of the house. You see this yellow here? Filling the interior of the house with a warm orc light to revitalize the body. As the sun would slowly start climbing up higher in the sky, the light inside the house would change from yellow to an intense red, a darker brown also, following the intensity of the activities during the day. And at noon, the color would actually change to blue, to a light blue, which would provide for a cooling atmosphere during the light break, maybe even during a siesta. Slowly in the afternoon, as we continue the, the route of the sun, the lights start becoming a little bit greener and greener, a, a color that actually calms the eyes and prepares the, the body for the coming of the night. And then, the color inside the house would turn again to this very light yellow, preparing for the night. Kisler thought that instead of relying on a mechanical clock that would splinter the day into minute divisions of time, what we do every day ourselves, basically, the inhabitants, with the use of the color clock, through this color clock, would become aware of the continuity of time based on the colors in the house alone. I will close this short presentation on the endless house with two more natural elements following the light, that of the fire of the water. Because both have always been important sources of life and Kisler placed them both in the floor of the endless house. For the fire, he was basically interested in finding a way to produce a fire. You can see here, there's like a fireplace in the very middle at the very heart of the domestic environment. And he was constantly interested in producing a fire that was self-contained, independent of any outer source. I had always been fascinated, he writes, by the smudge pots placed at night on the streets of New York to guard the open diggings of street repair. The flame of the smudge pot was just the type which presented itself in my vision, fluttering like a flag and giving off enough dark smoke to in the wooden sculpture above and around the flame. The idea was excited and appeared irrevocable for me. He never, although he never wrote anything more about fire, we can imagine the, high, the, the house with a fire pit and like a live fire constantly spreading the heat, the light throughout the space. With regards to water now, Kisler revisioned a series of bathing pools instead of conventional bathtubs. The ground floor, we can see here in large, actually shows a pool behind the main staircase that would be used for cleansing or even swimming. But also he imagined many other pools inside the house. The white emanated coffins, which are called bathtubs, and I repeat that, that's how he called bathtubs, the white enameled coffins, do not exist in any part of the endless house. Each of the space unit should have its own shape and style of indoor pool, surrounded by varying curtains of growing greenery. 
The water is renewed every minute and the temperature remains constant once set on the dial. None of these aspects appear on the drawings, on the sketches. You really understand more or less now, as I'm, as I'm closing slowly this first presentation of all the elements, that Kistler's ideas about this exuberant light of Leder's house can only be known, can only be understood if we look closely at his writings, his interviews, his words, and not necessarily the conventional means of architectural representation that we are so much in using. No matter what, the idea always remains the same, to create a domestic space full of magic through even the most simple and banal activity. Not even the faucet that brings water into your glass, into the tea kettle, through your shower and into the bath, that turn of handle and then the water flowing forth as from the rock touched by Moses, that sparkling event released through the magic invention of man's mind must always remain the surprise and the unprecedented an event of pride. I have to admit that during the two years of the pandemic, I have often thought and dreamed about this house, particularly here in the Netherlands that we had very strict curfews and we could really not leave the house. I have always dreamt of this house. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have windows that look at the stars or a color clock on my roof? However, wouldn't also all these elements together make living sometimes difficult or even unbearable? And even if this kind of living is possible, wouldn't its inhabitants become accustomed to its novelty and actually stop being fascinated by the challenges it offers and eventually treating it as a banal, normal, everyday conventional architecture after a while? I believe that understanding and interpreting the endless house as a domestic environment to be lived does not really align with Kistler's broad theoretical position. The fact that supports this hypothesis is basically that in 1958, Kistler received a $12,000 grant to prepare preliminary plans to build the endless house in one-to-one -one scale in the garden of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. The project never materialized because basically the museum built a new wing for temporary exhibitions uh, in the same space, but otherwise we would have had the endless house in the museum. The fact that Kistler wanted this project to be part of a museum exhibition is my biggest uh, indication that he never really thought, although he tried twice with two clients, to have that as an actual built living environment. He imagined it more as a possibility for people to visit for a while and to actually enjoy it as we enjoy theatrical performance, as we enjoy a concert, as we enjoy a piece of art that elevates us, that makes us rethink contemporary life, that makes us rethink the basic questions, that connects us with our dreams, that connect, connects us with our metaphysical concerns and anxieties. This temporary architectural experience would have encouraged the people which would have visited to question mainstream architectural practices and cultivate new ideas about domestic living. In the context of the museum, the endless house would basically have operated as a stage with, vis with visitors becoming both actors and spectators in an interactive plot with this environment. If Giorgio Agamben, the philosopher, is actually correct that we moderns must try and find meaning in biological life rather than in theology or metaphysics, then the endless houses instead is indeed, I'm sorry, a modern sacred space as Kistler had envisioned. Its architecture manifests how our daily activities can point to something beyond themselves to give charm of novelty to things of every day and excite of feeling analogous to the supernatural by awaking the mind's attention from the lethargy of custom. In short, the endless house was designed as a collection of creative moments in order to reveal the divine meaning beyond our everyday activities. According to Kistler, and with this slide I'm going to end today's lecture, architecture is striving instead of for simple shelter to be more than that. It is striving persistently to be even more emotional, more than aesthetic. Yet, 
when buildings are, are less than that all less we are to thank you very much wow that was so interesting i never heard. thank you sarah very kind i mean i've never i've never heard of him before and this whole um there's so many things that i could say right now but i just think um the practical and what he said about being the house being practical and magical i just found so um so right on, like, I think, you know, I, I love, I'm such a nester and I love creating, you know, a beautiful place to live and it's just me and my dog. Um, but there's something really emotional and, and, and um, rewarding about, about coming home to a place that you feel really comfortable in and, and is beautiful. And, um, and I think it is both practical and it is magical. And I think, um, you know, some, as someone who designs residential work, which sometimes gets poo-pooed by, you know, the architectural world, because it's not, you know, a museum or whatever, um, there is something really important about designing space that people live in every day. And, um, and I think you're right, you know, during the pandemic, it became so apparent to everyone that, you know, we were within our four walls um, and not leaving them for a while. Um, I have one question for you. I, I'm curious, because um, you answered the one I was going to ask you how he envisioned furniture. Um, how do you think he sort of would have thought or, or his thoughts would be um, about the perfect landscape or setting for his endless house? You know, you talked about the car coming underneath it, but I I want to know like what the context of that thing is. Like, it's just because, you know, I, I just can't imagine what the landscape would be around it. Yeah, that's a very good question because he doesn't really talk much about that, but he doesn't really envision it within a very uh, dense urban environment. It couldn't have worked. It has to be freestanding. It needs to be receiving sun and uh, wind from a a everywhere around. And uh, the few information we have in the book from uh, that uh, lot he visited in Florida was somewhere uh, like uh, outside uh, and really in the nature. So it's something like really surrounded by, by, by the landscape, I would say. That's, uh, that's the few things he has written. Uh, in the museum, it would have been a different thing, of course, and uh, you would have seen the walls of the other wings around you, for sure. But even in the museum, it would have been completely freestanding and you could walk around it and all. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it should be something that's like set within the middle of the desert with dunes that are like constantly shifting and, you know, open to the elements. And so that the, the natural forces of the wind and the sun and everything are the things that are kind of shaping and constantly changing the terrain. And, the dunes um, would have been really amazing. Like, yes, a context full of dunes, I think it would have been really fantastic for such a project. Yeah, particularly imagining the sun with the wind going all over the, all over the roof and yeah. making it really inhabitable the way he would have thought. Yeah, and of course, there are many things that somebody could say, okay, how would he do... Uh, like okay a floor with three bullets okay how would he do like right. this uh, this uh, bathing pools in every room with like greenery and all around the to me that's not really the point to me the point is that like why can't we just think about this everyday uh, uh everyday elements uh, very mundane regular elements in completely new ways in completely imaginative ways because there can be there are like uh, parts of that project that can the for example the idea of uh, the openings that are not just uh, glass that like right. colored, colored plastic, why not? Why couldn't we have some color coming inside our home, on our home, uh, in our homes, in particular, different climates and different geographic areas that can also be very necessary. Um, uh, in Mexico, for example, uh, uh, Luis Barragan has used this uh, technique in some, uh, in some of his houses, um, in, some, uh, how, in some parts of uh, domestic uh, environments that face the north, that this light is always very, you know, uh, the windows are colored yellow. So you receive a very warm light, although you're not really having the orientation that uh, explains this warm light. And it's really fantastic. I'm wondering, just my last question, then I'm going to open up to our two students. Um, but do, mm -hmm. do, in any of your um, readings, have you noticed that or read anything about Frank Lloyd Wright being inspired by Kiesler because of the whole machine for living and... Um, you know, an architect or the furniture being part of the house. And I mean, Frank Lloyd was, in, mm. it was very embedding his houses in this organic. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if they knew each other and I don't know if they had met, but I, I, they could have, I don't know. Kistler doesn't write something about that. I don't know Frank Lloyd writes writings that well and they are like, uh, <laughs> like the, the, the corpus of Frank Lloyd writes writings is, is huge. But it's also a little bit the time period because Kistler is not the only one who is thinking about this continuation between uh, uh, between the, the furniture and, uh, and the walls or uh, 
uh, a number of uh, furniture that are really not the conventional furniture. He's definitely not the only one. Um, I think uh, what made it, what, what was more interesting for Kistler, and uh, I think that where the biggest inspiration was, and I don't know how it worked, maybe the other way around, is that Kistler wor worked persistently and a lot, um, like most of his work was for the theater. And always mm -hmm. through the theater and through the setting of exhibitions, right. he always had the opportunity of reconsidering a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. And there, I think that's a huge privilege, right? Of course, because you are designing for something that is meant to be like uh, used for a couple of hours for a theatrical right. performance, for a show, for something. And then it's meant to be magical, right? Like how scenery changes, settings change so very fast. So I think that made his, uh, uh, that progressed a lot his architectural thinking in a very interesting way, mm -hmm. which other architects really didn't have much. And he's not that well known for his architecture, which is, um, I mean, he has built, he has built buildings, right? He's more well known for his, uh, his stage design. Yeah, that's a good point. It's very much kind of fictional and you don't have to focus so much on the reality. Yeah. Yeah. Lamar or Sharuz, do you have any questions? Thank you for coming, you too. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad that I was able to join. I really enjoyed um, your talk and I was not familiar with Kiesler's work at all before this and now um, I'm really interested to learn more. Um, I guess the question I have is, you know, like, um, Sharuz and I are both getting ready to graduate and like going out into the working Good world luck. and doing, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, you know, getting ready to go out and do, um, you know, like public projects, like probably smaller scale, like proposals in city spaces. Like what lesson do you think we can take from this like amazingly fantastical imaginative project to you know, like the real world of the projects we're going to be working on. Like, I, I really believe in, you know, having that kind of fantastical element, even in, you know, things that have to get built and used every day. And yeah, I'm just curious about what, what lesson do you think we can take from that and projects that we'll be working on? Yeah, to, to me, and I know what I'm going to say, it's difficult and I have practiced and I know what is the world out there because now I'm talking from a perspective of presenting like more of a historical kind of research and I know the difficulty. To me, the lesson is that you don't take anything for granted, uh, whether in the public space, we're in the private space, we're in the in between public and private. You don't take anything for granted. I know that in the demands of an office, time demands, cost demands, this is not, there's not always the time for stuff like that. But there can be very small and simple changes that can actually change the experience of either a public space or a private place. I was recently in a trip in Finland and I was um, uh, noticing a lot of, uh, I had the opportunity to visit a number of Alvaraldo's uh, uh, work. Uh, what I was fascinated by the most, and not it was nothing of all these amazing elements that uh, people talk about Alvaraldo, but it was like the handles of the doors in most of his buildings, the handles are designed in such an amazing way, such sensitive, such considerate, in such accordance with how your hand is about to, to touch the handle, that you can understand whether you need to push or pull without anybody having to put an unnecessary sign and tell you push or pull. And I'm talking about public buildings, about his uh, opera, uh, about uh, like bookstores, stuff like that. And just the design of this one element which were all custom made, was actually making the experience of entering the building so smooth, so interesting. Like I can still feel the touch of the material on my hand and me understanding what I need to do. This is what I'm like, my, that, 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 that is what I'm saying, because usually it will be, okay, we have to do that. The entrance here is like a, a prospectus with like 100 handles. What am I picking? What am I choosing? And we're going to put pull here and push here and, you know, and. That's the thing. Is there time for that? Is there the cost for that? That's a much bigger conversation, I understand. But there's always, I think, time to discuss these things and bring these things up and try and see if there are in some project the potential to do some of these things. Thank you. You're welcome. Very good luck. It's a very, it's a very nice uh, time period. You really, I hope you really enjoy. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions?
Well, you can find my mail very easily and send me any mails that may come to mind later. Okay, that's wonderful. Angela. Thank you so much. This was really a pleasure. I'm sorry we didn't have more students come, but I think- Don't um, worry, sir. Don't worry. I well, I'm sure, I'm sure tons will turn in, tune, tune in to the, um, the YouTube video, but I just, I was really, really pleased to meet you. I'm so glad that this worked out. And um, hopefully when I get myself to the Netherlands again, um, I'd be oh. to take the students and I- um, Oh, absolutely. Visit, we'd love to come and visit you. Absolutely. Please let me know. You have to come and visit the sister city, Rotterdam. You're going to love it. Yeah. It'd be fun. We'd love that. Definitely. Very nice. All right, Good we'll luck with the end of the semester, you guys.